Federal Reserve projection on economic growth just weakened substantially, and expectations for a rate cut over the next eight months got stronger. <laughs> the Atlanta Fed's closely watched GDP Now tracker, and I said that in the headlines, uh, and, and all this comes after a strong first three months, saw 3.2%. Disappointing retail sales in April fueled the latest leg down in the Atlanta Fed outlook. The Commerce Department reported Wednesday that sales declined two-tenths of a percent for the month against an expectation of a two-tenths of a percent gain. Along with the retail letdown, industrial production fell a half a percent against Wall Street's estimate of a 0.1 percent gain. Taken together, the weaker-than-expected numbers took a half a percentage point off of the Fed's previous second quarter estimate. The drop in GDP forecast coincided with market expectations that the Fed will be lowering interest rates in the month ahead. Futures traders now indicate an 80% chance of a rate cut by January 2020, according to the FedWatch tool. However, the decrease could come sooner than that. The tool assigns a 51% probability to move lower in September and 42% chance of two cuts by January. Fed officials have been unified in saying they don't uh, foresee a cut or increase before the end of the year. Um, so anyway, so they're so they're looking at that. That's that's one thing. So they include <clears throat> all retail yeah. sales with that, right? They have to have included all retail s- sales online. Yeah. yeah. And they have to. Yeah. Okay. I just don't see it. I don't understand. That makes no sense. People are spending less money. But you just got your tax re- <clears throat> refunds. I, that's a lot of people didn't get what they thought they were going to get. The numbers were about the same. The, the yeah. same amount got generated. That's already gone. I mean, that's done. You know, that's. But that was April. You're talking about <clears throat> being down. That doesn't yeah. make any sense. Well, it's the Fed. I mean, I trust their numbers. Hmm. I mean, you have to. Look, retail sales are retail sales. I mean, they're right. just, they're just numbers out there. You know. So, anyway, then uh, for for more good news. Okay. Uh, corporate debt is at an all-time high. Now that's true. Uh, it totals nearly $10 trillion right now, which is more than 60% higher than the last financial crisis. Measured against U.S. gross domestic product, GBT, the total value of goods produced and services provided in a single year, corporate debt is the highest it has ever been. Today, corporate debt equals 47% of U.S. GDP. In 2012, it equaled 40%. Companies gorge Wait a themselves. Minute. It was what percent, and now it's what percent? It was 40, now it's 47. Okay. Uh, companies gorge themselves on debt by taking advantage of the Federal Reserve's low interest rate, and they just did. I mean, they borrowed money like crazy, and a lot, of, and a lot of them just use it to buy back their stock, right? Which does nothing except make the people that run the companies richer because they got more stock than anybody else has. Um, so. Uh, company, da, 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 many companies simply can no longer afford their debt. Uh, at the same, yeah, you see, at the same time, U.S. corporate debt keeps churning higher. The quality of this debt is deteriorating. Deteriorating. It's, they should have changed that word. It's, it's a hard <laughs> word to pronounce. Many uh, uh, credit ratings agency S and P Standard Poor's rates about 7.2 trillion in U.S. corporate debt today. And roughly 85% of that is rated as uh, 85%, which is six trillion, is rated as investment grade. Uh, S&P ratings for investment grade go from AAA down to triple uh, B. Meanwhile, da, 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 said, but in, uh, investment grade doesn't mean what it used to. When you break it down further, you can see we're on the brink of a disaster uh, today. Almost three trillion dollars of invest of investment grade debt, about half of the six trillion dollars in total, is rated triple B. In other words, half of all investment grade debt is teetering on the edge of becoming junk, and junk is just lower rated bonds. That's significantly higher before in the 1990s. Triple B rated debt made up about 25 percent of all investment grade debt. In 2000, it was roughly 33 percent. And just before the last financial crisis, it was 37%. So now it's up to 50%. So it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And we've got a call. We've got a call. We got a call? Yeah. Does that mean we should take the call? Yes. Okay. (laughs) Good morning. You're on your money with Steve and Sherry. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Are you worried about the future? Uh, No, (laughs) ma'am. 
not at all. The only thing I worry about is is how I got so old so quick. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, it's, you're going to get older quicker. I know. I can tell you that. It is weird. Yeah. Could I digress a little bit into last week's program? Sure. Uh, yeah, we're, I have no idea what we talked I about. I have no idea what it is. We, <laughs> we were here, but we weren't here. <laughs> we were talking about some brass peacocks, I believe. Oh, yeah, yeah. The inheritance. Yeah. The legacy. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, I refer to it as the sediment of human habitation. Ah. <laughs> My question is, what do you do with all of it? Goodwill. Goodwill. <laughs> They went to Goodwill after about three months, and hopefully somebody enjoys them. I don't mean just the, I mean everything. You just, Salvation Army. The stuff you've got in your house, you know, dishes and a couch. And We had to get rid of everything, so we downsized about five years ago, and our kids didn't have room for any of it. Our daughter was living in a dorm in the military, and our son was living in an apartment. They had no room to take anything. They didn't really want any of it. And so we literally are called Salvation Army, and they came with a truck and two guys, and I walked around pointing at stuff, and they hauled it off and gave me a receipt, which is worthless now because you can't hardly make a donation you know, on your Schedule A. You can't deduct it anymore, but they were really nice. They didn't scratch the paint. They got everything out that I wanted out, and then we just had what we wanted, and we got rid of. You should have seen the attic in the garage. So I'm one of those people that used to decorate our house, like the whole yard, every holiday. Right. For Halloween, I would have all these things in the yard, Christmas lights. I would have all this stuff. I was always big on that. So we finally got up in the attic and we were going to move and threw everything into the garage. And we could not believe the piles of stuff, of just stuff that we kept shoving in the attic, thinking, oh, yeah, we might use that someday, and shoving, shoving, and and, and just at all. I mean, it's pointless to have a yard sale because you're not going to make any money. It's right. a waste of time. not worried so, about that. Yeah, so we just, Salvation Army and Goodwill, just pulled piles off and let someone else appreciate it and enjoy it. Okay. Well, I just, you know, I live next door to an Ace Hardware man. Mm. He comes to borrow stuff from me. I've got so much stuff. <laughs> There are, there's a... Uh, Make and Rescue Shelter yeah, yeah, is really good. Yeah, they have a place. And, the, and these folks will come out, they'll come pick it up. I mean, they're happy to, to get it. There's a, lot, there's a lot of places that, you know, they need they need furniture for, like, women's shelters and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, the Make and Rescue Mission, that's, I said it wrong, Make and Rescue Mission, I think they have a truck and they will come out and pick up stuff. Because what they do, I had a tour there years ago and I was really amazed at what they do. And they're just, they're right downtown Macon and they're an in-house where you stay, they have half of their shelter is for men and the other half is for women and children. And when you move in there, you commit to a six-month program. And if you're if you have, if you're addicted to drugs or alcohol, you go to a daily uh, program for that. You and everybody that lives there has to help run the place. So the people staying there are cooking and doing dishes and painting and doing repairs and doing the maintenance of the place while they're living there. Plus, they run the store that makes money to help fund the place. It's a really phenomenal operation, so that's another great place to donate. And, um, and Houston County has got a lot of places. They've got place. a shelter. Yeah, Perry's got some stuff. Warren Robbins has some stuff. So there's, I mean, there's plenty, Habitat, plenty. if you have building materials, take it to Habitat Restore. We've dumped a bunch of stuff off there because we had wood, all these boards and stuff. That we just, I took it there and dumped yeah. it off. I mean, we, we changed all our doorknobs. And, and dumped and, all of it out and, there because somebody can use it. it. Yeah, so they can, they're, they're building, ho- Habitat's building houses for people. And they can, I mean, the stuff that a lot of people have is like brand new. It doesn't. But get, you can go there and just buy stuff yourself. If you're remodeling a house, you can go buy fixtures and all sorts of stuff. The people yeah. donate. So there's lots of places to donate. But there's a, we're going to have a huge glut of antiques and silver in China that nobody wants. Yeah. Right. And so I got rid of a silver tea set. I had to let, I, I've been dragging a silver tea, like the huge silver tea services. I drug that thing around the world for 25 years. <laughs> and finally it's like, what am I doing? I'm, I can't use this. And so I found someone to donate it to. And I had a, a punch, giant punch bowl with 36 cups that I drug all over the world. Right? We have this stuff because it's sentimental. Somebody, it was important to somebody, so we feel like we have to hang on to it. But if you're not going to use it, it's got to gotta go yeah. eventually. And Randy just texted and said, you know, you, you put it on Craigslist and do it that way if you want to do that. Yeah, you could possibly I'd rather sell give some it away. stuff. I'd rather give it, it away because there are people that really need it. I don't know if anybody needs a punch bowl with 36 cups. <laughs> and uh, well, in this, day, know. They might in this day and age. Yeah, I guess maybe for a wedding or something. I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, there's, I don't know. I don't Set know what you free. do with the old, the old silver. I mean, who's going to... 
I got rid of all that. It's really kind of funny. It'll probably come back someday. I doubt it because nobody wants to clean it. That's the problem. That doesn't mean every generation is going to be like. Maybe you're going to get a generation that likes to, Mm, yeah, that appreciates good stuff. I don't know. I got I got rid of all the. I kept one silver thing for my grandmother, one little tiny thing, and it's in a box somewhere. Just because I felt guilty, I needed to keep something of hers. And so I have a Norwe- guilt's, all, guilt's always a great reason to do. So. I have a Norwegian plate. That's about it. That's about the only thing I've left. Yeah. Yeah. But I it's got, okay. It feels really silver, good. I got silverware that my mother had and has an R on it. You know. Mm-hmm. And uh, we got a Nancy get, likes a to polish picture, it. But then never comes out of the. Never comes out. <laughs> I can it's, see it's, Nancy polishing the silver yeah. right now. <laughs> it is just. It, it is just in a cabinet, and it just sits there along with all that stuff. Family. It's a huge problem. Almost every one of my clients has this problem. We talk about it all the time. And the family doesn't want it because the grandchildren want new stuff. They want modern stuff. Yeah. So so what are you going to do? Well, just give it away to somebody sounds like a good idea to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, I mean, you can, and that way you're helping other people. Yeah. Right. So, Freeing up your space. Are you going to downsize? In a way, yes, because I just literally, I'm I'm serious about the Ace Hardware man. He comes and borrows stuff from me. I've got so much stuff. Mm-hmm. He comes, you know, he comes and gets tools and all kinds of things. Next time he borrows it, just say keep it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's my idea. Except he's about my age and he's downsizing too. Yeah, well, right. T- well, tell just tell him, just tell him that you cannot. He can't take the stuff if he brings it back again. <laughs> <laughs> a condition of him borrowing it is never to return it. There you go. And that's it. That's the way that that's the tools way it works. Should, tools Otherwise, about, we'll never. I'll never lend you anything again. Tools are something you actually can sell. People actually do want tools. Yes. So you could put that on Craigslist, but everything else, I don't know. I don't know if you want somebody coming to your house. Right. So. Yes, I really worry about that. I'm yeah. very cautious about that. Yeah, so just give it away. Make it easy on yourself. Leave it by the side of the road. We did that to a bunch of stuff. We just set it out like on a Saturday night and just left it there, and by the next day it was gone. <laughs> People I, just come take it. <laughs> you know, you know, That's what we used to do at the office is, you know, people would... Yeah, you know, like uh, I had bicycles I had to get rid of. Right. I, put them, I just put them out by the, the side of the road. And bong, they're gone. They <laughs> magically disappeared. <laughs> so anyway, thanks for calling. Thank you. I wish you Thank the you. best. Uh, bye. Bye. Yeah, all my clients are trying to figure out what to do with their piles, and some of them have inherited generations of stuff because everything flows downhill, and now their houses are full of all these antiques and stuff, and they're trying to get rid of this. It's, it's a, and they feel that they can't because they belong to somebody and they were important to those people. But those people are past and gone, and so they don't care. They're not here anymore. Seven four two zero nine forty is the number. Good morning. You're on with Sherry and Steve. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. I want to throw this real quickly. It's an old saying I heard a long time ago. Things will always be different when now becomes later. Hmm. Because I remember in the 80s when compact discs, took over all the space at the record store. Right. People said, that's it for records. Vinyl is gone. Well, things have changed. And you know my car... You never know what will come around later. I know you don't. And then stuff comes back. But my car doesn't even have a CD player in it. (laughs) It's gone. Things can change. There's no way to play my CDs. Great show. (laughs) Keep it up. All right, thanks. 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 Have a good day. The, the way you play your, the play the way you play your CDs is you put CD you put your CDs into iTunes right and then you uh, have the music on your iPhone right and then you have Bluetooth on your iPhone and the car right and you play it that way you know but I don't listen to music anymore okay well that's different I just need to donate all the CDs somewhere I got a pile have piles of them from the past and I don't even care I mean I I listen to Pandora on the weekends. I just don't care. I'm such a, um, I don't know. I just, I listen to what I want to listen to and the rest of it just, I'm very low maintenance, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. You can listen to podcasts in the car if you like that. I used to do that. Yep. I mean, there's all kinds of podcasts I know. out there. I listen to sports podcasts in the car. I listen to Ohio State. They get, Ohio State's got like eight or nine guys who do podcasts every week. A lot of times when we're driving, I read a book to Randy. I read things to him that he doesn't get around to reading, oh. and that's how we catch up on stuff. So, speaking of reading, um, so getting the books on 
on your phone and on, stuff? On the phone. From Audibles the, from, and all that? From the library. Right. You just go to the library, get a library card, and they'll walk you through the steps of how to download the books. You can download uh, one at a time, and you can have a queue of books that you want to download. And then I think you have them for two weeks, and you can renew them. Um, or, or when you finish them, you just check them back in because they can only check them out so many times to so many people. Uh, so I think it's only one at a time, actually. And then the next one will download. And they've been doing that for free for years. Because if you use Audible, you got to pay. Right. But it's free through the library. All the libraries probably are. Mm-hmm. All of them do it. Yeah, because we talk, like when we go to Charleston, you know, Charleston for the weekends. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's about four and uh, four-ish hours there and four-ish mm-hmm. hours. I say eight hours, you're getting a book, right? In eight hours? Right. I mean, got, we've got to be able to finish it in the car. Otherwise, it's not going to do us any good. We don't want to just... You can just sit in the car until it's done. <laughs> We could take the long way back. There you go. Let's just go, drive let's right get in off the inter- Let's get off of 16, <laughs> and let's go up through Washington County and all that kind of stuff. And we'll drive through downtown Dublin and uh, go over to uh, Danville. Go through McDonald's, get something to eat, and just sit in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Anywho, yeah. what else you got Amazon, that's negative and scary? Amazon. I wasn't finished with the other stuff. Okay. I don't know if you want to hear the rest of this or not. But it's just... It's just um, I mean, they've been talking about this for a year. They've no. been running that same story for a year. Well, th- they ran it before the last one for a couple of years, too, but they were totally right. I mean, you, right. Can, you don't know the timing. All right. You can do, all you can do is, you know, if the prediction eventually comes true, which it did, the last time they said this, right. I, mean, they hit, I mean, they just nailed it. But the timing is always because they can always prop up stuff until it, you know, it's like putting out, you know, somebody's somebody's – got so much time to live but then they keep keep that person alive longer and then eventually they pass away and that's you know you, you can't you can't argue with with the numbers i mean if it's worse than the last time you know you'd think that everybody learned their lesson from the last financial crisis but nobody ever learns a lesson it's the same you know they just do the same thing i mean commercial personal debt is crazy you know people are up to their eyeballs in in debt you know taking money out of their retirement plan so they can pay off debt and spend the money and buy stuff with it so anyway and the, so so the, the concern about the whole thing is really the uh, the uh, debt that is um, the high yield debt the junk the junk debt the, the junk bonds junk bonds the are higher risk the high risk stuff that's that's who gets it first and you can you can kind of tell and so during the last financial crisis you had all these companies that borrowed so much money, and eventually they couldn't finance the debt, and they, you know, got downgraded, and the debt defaulted, and what have you, and we ended up with a financial crisis. So it's good. it's not going to be the big the big companies, but just just understand that when you see a high interest rate being paid on a financial instrument, that means it's higher risk than the others. So you know the big companies, the name companies borrow at low rates. The not-so-great companies have to pay higher rates. And so when you buy that higher rate stuff, you're taking higher risk because it's not insured. So you're just depending on that company to be able to pay off the debt. And here's part of the issue is we're going through a massive industrial revolution with technology that is really taking off right now. And so you have companies leveraging themselves so they can invest in the infrastructure to create the company that's going to do X, that's going to run uh, computerized everything, robotic everything. I mean, look at Tesla. Look at the money that they're throwing around. I mean, it's crazy how much they're spending. And people are finally starting to pay attention to go, wow, they're not doing so good. Yeah. So, I mean, they're just one example. But look at the a debt that they're in. Look at – And all they'll these, never be able to pay it off. And all these companies that are out there investing in all of this new stuff, believing they're going to be the next great thing. It's kind of like the tech bubble that we had before where you had all this high-tech stuff, you know, and everybody was super high in debt so that they could be the next great big tech company, and they all didn't make it. They're all not going to make it. All of the the – the pot companies are not going to make it. All of the uh, companies that invest in, in um, 
artificial intelligence are not going to make it, and all of the companies that invest in immunotherapy drugs are not going to make it, that everybody wants to try to make the next big thing. And you have a lot of that going on right now because we're going through this big wave of, you know, 5G is coming, and so all of this new Internet of Things, everybody's going to want to dive into this and be the next great whatever, and we're going to have another bubble of all of that, and a bunch of companies are going to fail. And so you have to be very careful what you get into because a lot of it's going to be speculative. Like, look at uh, look at Uber. I don't know who would want to invest in that company. Our son-in-law drove for them for a while, and he said, you can't make any money. It's, it's To me, there's something wrong with the whole concept. There's, I mean, there's you don't make enough money to survive, and you're destroying your car at the same time. It, it makes no financial sense to me, but they just had an IPO. And so it was, it was and it didn't go so good. So you have to be careful what you jump into thinking, oh, this is going to be the next great thing. You need to do your homework and make sure that it doesn't implode on you. Because this, I think we're going to head into the exact same thing, and people are going to be investing in all of this high-tech, robotic everything, and not all of it's going to make it, and some of it's going to blow up. Well, just so you know, it's not all crazy people talking. According to data from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, U.S. companies are more leveraged today than they ever were before. Uh, according to a study from J.P. Morgan Chase, the net ratio for all lower-rated companies has almost doubled uh, to what it then doubled from what it was in 2000 to 2017. So, but don't you think it's because of low interest rates too? Yeah, all but, this debt. Yeah, that's. I mean, a, I have that, clients yeah. that that went out and got cars, and they're like, "Why should I have? Why should I pay it off if there's zero interest?" So they have more debt than they normally would because yeah, the, the interest got, rates are so yeah, low. Then that's fine for the Microsofts of the world, mm-hmm. but it's not for the not for the cr- crummy companies. Okay. I mean, their rates are lower than than they would have been in the past, but if they're still paying high high rates. They still have to service all that debt. Right. And they just keep adding debt and adding debt and adding debt, and then when debt matures, they take debt, new debt to pay just off. Just to the, roll it over. Yeah, and eventually, you know, the merry-go-round. It stops. blows up. Yeah. If they don't do well. If they don't keep growing, it blows up. And that's what happened in 07. Yes. And it's going to happen again. It's just timing is always the issue because you can't time anything. You never know when things are going to happen. But you do have to know the risk you're taking when you're investing your money. And if you're getting a high rate of returns, if you're getting six, sevens, eights, nines, and tens, yes. that means you're taking you're taking risk. I mean, yep. Pure and simple because they got to pay you. The reason, the reason the interest rate's higher is because you're a worse risk, just like the difference between uh, – you know, you going in and getting a loan and some wealthy person getting a loan, they'll get a better interest rate than you because you're a higher risk than, than that person. That's just the way it works. So interest rates tell it all and ratings tell it all. Yes. So That's the good news for today. Okay. So they announced Friday to lift steel and aluminum tariffs on Canada and Mexico. Did you see that? Yes. So... Um, the interesting thing to me, what I would like to know, is when they lift the tariffs, how fast does that translate into reducing the prices of aluminum and steel? Because I know that this has been a huge problem with construction projects across the United States, and I know that here in Bibb County, I read last year there was a school that's being built that because of these tariffs was uh, $6 million over budget. And I've only seen the article one time. I've never seen a follow-up. I don't know how they're dealing with it. I don't know if they stopped construction or if they just pressed on and and are going to somehow come up with that money. But it's a huge problem for infrastructure spending when you have prices that go through the ceiling of stuff you have to have to build whatever you're building. So, um, anyways, this deal is supposed to help the chance of getting the U.S., um, Mexico, and Canada, uh, whatever – trade deal through. It's supposed to be one of the roadblocks that was holding it up. And then Trump said they're going to delay tariffs on importing cars, imports of cars and auto parts from Europe, Japan, and other countries. And then Japan announced yesterday that they've agreed to lift long-standing restrictions on American beef exports. Uh, Back in 2005, Japan imposed age restrictions on U.S. beef because of mad cow disease. And now they have just agreed to remove that whole uh, age limit and they're going to start increasing the the um, their imports of our beef, and this is uh, Secretary Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue uh, has been working on this. American beef sales to Japan topped two billion dollars last year, representing one fourth of all beef exports. Is that crazy? One fourth of our beef exports goes to one country, Japan. 
Really? Yeah, not that interesting? Yeah. So they should increase beef sales 7 to 10%, which means all the really high-quality beef is going to be going to Japan, and the stuff you're going to buy at the store is not going to be so good. Because that's what we do is we export the good stuff, and what's left over, we and we import cheap stuff from wherever for us to eat. Did you know that? No. That's why that's why the orange juice here is not as good a quality as other places because we export the good oranges because we can make more money, and then we import cheap oranges and we make the juice out of them. I'm for that. <laughs> kind of like nothing like cheap oranges. <laughs> this article, um, this is from CNBC. The headline is Trump's tariffs are equivalent to one of the largest tax increase increases in decades. The combined seventy-two billion dollars in revenue from all the president's tariffs ranks as one of the biggest increases since nineteen tax increases since nineteen ninety-three, according to a CNBC analysis of data from the Treasury Department. The tariff revenue ranks as the largest increase as a percentage of GDP since 1993 compare when compared with the first year of all the revenue measures enacted since then. Um, so, says uh, this is from uh, Steve Leisman, uh, one of their smart economists. Uh, President Donald Trump's having championed one of the largest tax cuts in recent years now has enacted tariffs equal to one of the largest de- uh, tax increases in decades. Uh, and it just goes on, on there. What but I heard, though, this week is that if you boil it down, it's to the cons- consumer, it's pennies. Yeah. But it's nothing I, it, because it sound, the numbers are big, but when you translate it into actual what we spend and how many people are in this country, that it's meaningless well, still. So this little, there's a little tweet from uh, Jim Rickards. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's, says, a, he's uh, a fun he says, talk, guy. <laughs> talks, of, talks of tariffs imposing high costs on U.S. consumers is mostly globalist propaganda. Here's why. One... Supply chains can source in non-tariff nations. Right. Two, distributors can eat some of the tariff. Three, consumers can buy other goods. And four, consumers can skip purchases. But it does hit China. Well, that's too bad for China. So, I mean, mm-hmm. so that's, and the other thing is, and I can't find the article, Pat Buchanan uh, wrote, and I printed it out. I always do this. I print these articles out, and then somehow some of them escape. <laughs> On the way over here, but it was um, gremlins. But I, so you talk about something while I try to find this article. For so me. I think uh, this is a really interesting article. So you understand about the whole everybody on the Democrat side that's running for president uh, wants to have Medicare for all. They're all piling into this concept, and I read yes this last week that the cost would be three trillion dollars a year. Uh, which is more than the we can pot. If you could tax everything in every direction and you can't raise that much money, even if you do all the Bernie Sanders taxes, it, it's not enough to make Medicare for all free for everybody. Um, and then this is the interesting part. So Joe Biden came out this week and he said, right now you have this overwhelming number of employers who are paying into the health care plan. Why let them off the hook? All of a sudden they don't have to pay anything. And he's talking about Medicare for all. So you're talking about moving everybody onto a single-payer plan that would be funded by tax cuts, and Joe Biden's like, not so fast. Let's make the employers pay for it. Well, part of Bernie Sanders' thing is you would raise payroll taxes on the employer side 7%, payroll taxes on the employee side 4%, and that goes into this giant pot that all these other taxes go in to pay for this. And so this is written by a business owner, and he says, I'd rather pay a predictable, manageable payroll tax to finance health care than pay impossibly high and unpredictable premiums. And so as an employer, yeah, paying 7% payroll tax and have free health care for all your employees and get out of having to even deal with health care at all. He's like, sure, sign me up right now. I'm all for it. That's scary. It's scary because it doesn't work, and they're going to have to keep coming after people for additional taxes. There's not, if this ever happened, there's no way that's enough money to pay for all of this. The numbers don't add up. Anybody, everyone has analyzed this into the dirt, and it doesn't make sense from any direction. None that it, you can't do it. But the fact that people are piling on and saying, "Yeah, bring it on," I wouldn't have to pay for health care. Sure, I want it free. Yeah, I'll take that. Right? Yeah. Let's go for it. Hmm. Um, I found this, this. I thought this was a good article. This is Pat Buchanan. I just, oh, you I, found it. I love Pat Buchanan. It's the headline is tariffs, the taxes that made America great, and then he go. He just starts out talking about stuff. Uh, 
A tariff may be described as a sales or consumption tax the consumer pays, but tariffs are also a discretionary and optional tax. If you choose not to purchase Chinese goods and instead buy comparable goods made in other nations or the USA, then you do not pay the tariff. China loses the sale. That's why Beijing, which runs 350 to 400 billion in an annual trade surplus at our expense, is howling the loudest. Should Donald Trump impose that 25% on all 500 billion in China exports to the United States, it would cripple China's economy. Factories seeking assurances, da 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 da. Tariffs were the taxes that made America great. They were the taxes relied upon by the first and greatest of our early statesmen before the coming of the globalist Woodrow Wilson and FDR. Tariffs to protect tariffs to protect manufacturers and jobs were the Republicans' party party's <coughs> path to power and prosperity in the 19th and 20th century, before the rise of the Rockefeller Eastern Liberal Establishment and its embrace of the British-bred heresy of unfettered free trade. The Tariff Act of 1790, uh, 1789 was enacted with the declared purpose, quote, the encouragement and protection of manufacturers, end quote. It was a second act passed by the first Congress led by Speaker James Madison, and it was crafted by none other than Alexander Hamilton and signed by President Washington. And so that's how it's allowed the country to grow. You know, so... So I mean, there are you know you you can you can get it around you just get you buy your product somewhere else and there's always going to be other countries and other people absolutely that can make the step product up. and you don't have to get it from China right and they can open factories anywhere and this is his whole Trump's whole strategy is to yeah. put the hurt on them so they'll come to the table yeah. and the biggest problem is this identity uh, this international inter- intellectual property theft and they're still working on how they're going to fix that <clears throat> and that's that's going to be the toughest one yeah so to close the trade deal. Anyway, we've, you know, we've had usually it gets you know, Bush Bush tried tariffs, uh, W tried tariffs, and that had, they had to roll them back. But I don't know Trump's Trump's more stubborn than Bush was, so hopefully he'll he can hang on. So this is very interesting to me. The highest or the biggest disruption in higher education, instead of going to college to get a job, students will increasingly be going to a job to get a college degree. This makes so much sense. It says the shift will go down as the biggest disruption in higher education, whereby colleges and universities will be disintermediated by employers and job seekers going direct. This is already happening in the case of working adults and employers that offer college education as a benefit, but it will soon be true among traditional age students. Uh, This disruption is being driven by several converging forces, the unsustainable rise in college tuition, a change in consumer demand among prospective students, extreme negativity about the work readiness of college graduates, an unpacking of what makes colleges effective, and emerging emerging talent attraction and development strategies by employers. 74% of all parents of K-12 students would consider a route where their child would be hired directly out of high school by an employer that offers a college degree while working. Doesn't Frito do that? Frito-Lay is offering internships because they can't find people to run equipment in their company. So they're going to the Houston County schools and talking to seniors and asking them to sign up for a five-year internship. Well, they, they'll be paid while they're learning on the job. And after five years, they'll be able to run all of this equipment, manufacturing equipment, wow. because there aren't enough people studying this stuff to hire. They have stuff, machines just sitting they can't even run because there's nobody to run them. So that's what they're doing. Um Today's college students are actually the least working generation in U.S. history, driven by a current dissatisfaction with the work relevance of college and the work readiness. They're studying stuff they don't need to be studying. Um, two types of students for which it must be suited and appealing, ambitious and diverse, ambitious, ambitious and debt averse, and those who are college hesitant and debt averse. Two employers, such as Price Waterhouse Coopers, are already offering these kinds of opportunities where students can go straight from high school into apprenticeship programs. And there's a growing trend among large employers to offer college degrees as an employee benefit to attract and retain better talent. Uh, Walmart, Discover, Starbucks, Disney, and Papa John's are all offering college. At Walmart, if you pay, a, I think it's a dollar a day, you get free college. But it's something like a, you have to you have to have some skin in the game. You have to be working there full time, uh, but it's to retain people. Bulk rate tuition discounts. Um, anyways, it makes total sense to me. Instead of just studying something, you don't even know if you're going to get a job once you graduate. I can't believe the people we meet who have degrees they can't use. You know, and all this debt. I were talking to a lady mm. last Saturday. She owes eighty thousand dollars in student loans, and she's working in a, as a waitress. And she's like, I. I it's, 
I mean, I can't finish college because I can't afford to take on more debt. I mean, this whole thing is insane. Yeah, well, the whole the whole college thing is criminal at this point. It is. It's gotten it's, so it's out of control. It's criminal, absolutely criminal because the college is just mm. one students, and they don't care how much the students owe. And well, you know what drove it is the stupid federal student loans, where you can just get unlimited money without any care about what you're actually studying and what you're actually going to earn. And you, I had met a lady who's working for Central Georgia Tech, making sixty grand. She is capped out. She owed $250,000 in student loans. And she used that money, federal, to federal student loans, to pay her, her rent, her car payment, all of her food, plus her college, plus going out, her clothes, everything. She spent federal student loan money to fund a lifestyle, and now she's working for 10 years, and it'll be, it'll be paid off for free for her. It'll be forgiven. Because of the type of work she does, wow. we're going to pay for that, and so that needs to stop. Yeah. The federal student loan program is a ridiculous waste, and it's it's driven so many people into horrible debt. It's it's cr- that is criminal. And then you had the for profit companies. Well, no, but they, were even worse. if you can get if you can get as much money as you want, why not everybody raise prices? That's what happens when there's free money flowing around everywhere. Yeah, you can jack up prices because everybody will just borrow more money. It's like the housing market. Houses are going to go up in value, so just borrow more money. The houses are all going up in value, so just oh, housing prices are going up. Everybody just keeps writing loans, even though it's unsustainable. Same thing. Anyways, this is just ridiculous, but I really think that's a very common sense deal. So if you have grandchildren getting ready to graduate from high school, there's a couple things they need to understand. One is that, and the second thing is dual enrollment. I emailed uh, the woman who, uh, she's the recruiter at a middle Georgia tech, and I asked her, I said, how many middle Georgia students are enrolled in dual enrollment? And that's where you're going to college the last two years of high school, so you graduate high school with a high school diploma and an associate's degree. She said there's almost 500 kids in the program right now in middle Georgia, which is fantastic. Because that's, talk about saving piles of money. I mean, they're living at home and getting their associate's degree. And then they already have some good study habits probably before they go off to actual college instead of going right from high school to college. They already understand the pressure. So I, I, both of those things I think are great. You should have somebody, like when I'm not here something, mm-hmm. have somebody from one of the tech schools come up and talk. And talk about the High Demand Career Initiative and all that. Yeah. We should really do a podcast about it is what we should do. I should do an interview. We should do a program and then podcast it because everywhere I go I tell people about it and they've never heard of it. And I yeah. don't understand why nobody's getting the word out. I guess the counselors only cherry pick kids out of the school that they think could handle it, and they don't talk to everybody about it. But they should be talking to kids in ninth grade about it, and parents, and saying, "Hey, this is available. Your grades matter. You need to suck it up and get busy here. And if you really want to knock this out and save piles of money, get on track." So something is missing somewhere. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Seven four two zero nine. Four zero is the number. Good morning. You're on your money with Steve and Sherry. Good morning. I thought I was talking to a recording. This is uh, <laughs> this is <laughs> you were talk- this is yeah. this is Tommy Gauss. I'm a, I'm their twenty third long lost cousin. Oh I great. Want to talk to them about about the college education stuff. Yes. <laughs> How are you all doing? This we're doing morning? great. How are you doing? Oh, fantastic. Good, good, good. But anyhow, uh. On the on the college stuff, you know, there's so many students going six years to get a four year degree. Right. And I have nicknamed them frolicaholics because they you check in all the colleges and the party situation and everything else. Right. They're out there partying on mine and your dime. Yep. And, and the parents and don't really, seem to care. They, and and they're being brainwashed. It only takes nineteen days to completely brainwash a person. Go back and refer to Patty Hurst. Uh, and the thing about it is these schools have years of propaganda to brainwash these people against our society, and we're paying for it. Well, most the, largest, the largest lawsuit that ever should be filed is for these people going to college and not getting an education. And, and, and part of the thing, it, part of the problem is that the professors tend to be very liberal, and so they want sure. everything for everybody. And they don't think yeah. of the, they don't think of the consequences of what they're doing to the kids. They just want them to get the college education, regardless of what right. what it's going to cost them. Because if the co- and if the colleges cared, they wouldn't do this to the kids. 
Correct, and they can audit these courses that they decided that they were partying instead of studying. They can audit these courses at midterm, and uh, they can just take it over again. So they're they're taking six years to get a four year degree because yeah. they're out there partying, and they, you know what? That's fine with the professors. Well, they partied when I went. To, people they partied when I went to college, but they got a degree. But really, the without parents the debt, without the debt. The parents need to be driving the boat on this, or the bus, or whatever you want to call it. I mean, absolutely, the parents should need absolutely. to be in the driver's seat, and the parents in should be holding kids seat. accountable. And if you're not cutting it in college, you're going to have to go get a job and stop getting in debt. I mean, I just think it's stupid. I know several people that are just head over heels in debt because of their loans. You know, their student yeah. loans. So and. They don't have a chance of paying them back, and if they bankrupt on it, uh, it goes back to the taxpayers again. I think it's something over what four trillion dollars that it's uh, huge that, that students uh, owe the owe the on their loans and stuff. And but anyhow, y'all have a blessed day. And I'm glad, <laughs> glad, I, glad After glad that I good news, that, <laughs> we're gonna miss. We're okay, gonna well, have... well, I'll tell you what. We'll talk about the post office next week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> y'all take care. You God too. Bless. Yeah. Hey, this reminded me, um, I had a note to myself, there's an individual who listens to this program every Saturday, and he is a barber, and I met a barber this last week who came to see me for retirement planning, who had some really creative ideas of how he is making a lot of money, and so if you are listening to me, you need to call me or email me this week, Mr. Barber, I cannot remember your name, um, because this, this guy was outside the box and killing it as a barber. It was so cool. Anywho, what else you got? Uh, I don't know. So Walmart is opening dozen of, dozens of vet clinics, and this is very smart, uh, in their stores. So you can take your pet, drop it at the pet pharmacy, or I mean at the pet clinic, do your grocery shopping, and then pick or get your pet groomed or whatever, and then pick your pet up and leave. I mean, it makes sense wow. to me. Yeah. So they already operate 21 vet clinics in its stores across six states, but over the next 12 months, they're going to grow that number to 100. They'll offer vaccines, care for minor illnesses, and routine exams along with grooming and all that. They also have an online pet pharmacy, Walmart Pet Rx, which rivals PetSmart's e-commerce business, Chewy.com. Uh, they're going to offer low-cost prescriptions for dogs, cats, horses, and livestock from 300 brands. They've seen a roughly 60% increase in the number of dog and cat related health care items sold on its website in one year did you hear that 60 percent increase in one year of pet supplies and dog supplies in one year 60 percent increase wow that's huge uh, more shoppers in the u.s are pampering their pets opting to splurge a little more for better care and organic food options a record 72 and a half billion was spent on pets in the u.s last year compared with 60 billion four years ago uh, in 2018, pet parents spent the most on food, then vet care, then supplies and over-the-counter meds, and purchased $2 billion on purchasing the pets themselves. It's a status thing for millennials, the type of pet they have. If you come downtown and walk around, you will not believe the beautiful animals that these college kids have. They're purebred. They're not some mutt from a shelter thing. They're they're like in huge, beautiful dogs. Yeah, probably bought with student loans. Be, probably their parents' visa card. Um, Hopefully. Anyways, pet food. So okay, sales of this is the next trend: fresh pet food. So this is fresh, like somebody made it. It doesn't come in a bag or a can. It's up seventy percent. Dog, dog doesn't know. Far, with farm raised you, you chicken. Ask your dog if he wants fresh farm raised or store bought. So Petco has partnered with a company called Just Food for Dogs to open a kitchen in New York where it says it will produce more than 2,000 pounds of fret, fresh pet food a day. This is why people don't have money. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. Right? It's, animals will eat, animals smell their own, you know what? I mean, you think they're going to care whether it's organic or not? Well, the, the quality of the food does matter to their health. It does. We've had pets a long time, but, but the fresh thing, I mean, that's, I don't know. That's a whole new trend that I can't get on with. I just find it amazing. The pet spending is amazing. The, but I see it all day long. All the pet lovers now hate me. <laughs> um, tax. Look at uh, tax burden by state. If you want to know where we fall, Georgia is 35th. That's right. Yeah, 35th in tax burden. Total tax burden in Georgia is 8.1%. Um, 
2.7% of that is property taxes. That puts us 28th in the country, the highest. Uh, individual tax burden is 23, 23rd. Uh, and total sales, uh, total sales taxes were 37th. So overall, though, we're, you know, not bad. In the middle of the road. Yeah, worst is New York. New York is sixth in property tax. So tw so the total tax burden in Georgia is 8.1%. Uh, total tax burden in New York is right at 13%, and it's going to go higher because the communist de Basio keeps raising taxes. Property tax burden. But they have free pre-K now. Uh they're number they're number one in individual income tax burden, which is not they keep raising individual tax rates. Property tax burden, they're, they're, but they are number thirty nine. Oh, that's the wrong one. There's, I'm sorry. New York is first in individual tax burden. It's sixth in property tax burden and twenty first in total tax. Didn't they eliminate burden. plastic straws too? And styrofoam cups. Isn't uh, he know, the guy that did that? Probably. Yeah, I where was we were somewhere and they they served like they must, it must have been in New York with uh, the paper straw the old paper straws you know and I who kinda, cares I I kind of like the old it, I think the plastic's better because stuff slips up you don't have to suck as hard because <laughs> because plastic <laughs> is shiny and everything all <laughs> the stuff just comes right up so you know it's not as much effort to drink oh gosh to drink your coke. Really? I don't know and if why. Drinking, I don't, and if you're drinking a smoothie or a Slurpee or something, you don't have to work as hard. And oh, the ships are doing, cruise ships are doing that, and and so they don't break that plastic doesn't break down. I don't know why it's all not biodegradable by now. When we know how to make it biodegradable, I don't understand plastic? why all of that, all of forks, cups, plates, it should all be biodegradable. We shouldn't be using styrofoam. I mean, it's just stupid. Yeah, it is a problem. <clears throat> I mean, it's a problem all over, and there's just and there's just garbage all over the place <laughs> you're just like a little sunshine today aren't you <laughs> yeah after you're going to so after you stop listening to us don't go out and shoot yourself today. <laughs> so are you going to go eat a plant-based whopper i don't eat any based whopper so the original whopper is 660 calories the impossible plant-based fake meat whopper is 630 calories and has basically the same Nutritional value is just less protein. It's not healthier. Don't fool yourself that an impossible Whopper is healthy for you. <laughs> 660 calories and one just for the sandwich, and then you add whatever else you're going to have with it is too much. Yeah, the fries. Then eat some fries and a Coke. Yes, don't get the Diet Coke. Get the real Coke. <laughs> Let's load up the calories. Let's and then add an ice cream. Let's, yes. There I, you go. Yeah. <laughs> get your entire nutritional they, oh, everything. I don't know if Burger King has ice cream. McDonald's has ice cream. I don't know. I'm sure they've got something in there. But anyhow, I just, the whole, this whole impossible meat thing, that was another IPO. It's like, you know, that everybody's piling into this thing because they think everybody's going to want to eat fake meat. I have no interest in it if it's the same calories and it's not any good for me. It's not, it's all processed. Makes no sense. So think carefully when you invest. Do your research. Really read, look at the numbers, look at what the thing is, and don't just jump into things on a, Unfortunately, the, the people that need to hear this are not listening to the show. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> so, anyway, well, what are you going to do? It's uh, here's a quick thing. We only got a couple minutes left. Don't visit your doctor in the afternoon. Because he'll be tired and grabby. This was written by a doctor. He's a, me he's a professor of medicine at Northwestern. He said, at 3 o'clock p.m., I've been seeing patients for a few hours, and I feel like my focus is fading. I need to stay sharp for those who come. I grab a snack and some coffee. This has become my afternoon ritual in my 20 years as a primary care doctor. Now a new study confirms that my feared 3 o'clock fade is real, and it could affect patients' health. According to a study by the Journal of the American Medical Association Network Open, doctors ordered fewer breast and colon cancer screenings for patients later in the day compared to first thing in the morning. All the patients were due for screening, but order rates were highest for patients who had appointments around 8 a.m. By the end of the day, the rates were like 10 to 15% lower. Probable reasons, running late and decision fatigue. Anyway, I'm not going to read the whole article, but that's, that's a look. And this was, I mean, this guy's a professor at one of the best colleges in the country. Well, people get tired. Yes. So go to your doctor in the morning. <laughs> 
tip send, of the day. Would send uh, yeah. and stay away from the impossible meat. Yeah, so <laughs> the impossible meat. <laughs> That's what it's called. Impossible. Because it's impossible to make. <laughs> Fake meat. You can't have a fake meat. Make your own. If you want fake meat, you can go get a recipe off the internet and make it yourself. Then you at least know what's in it. You can't have fake meat. It's either meat or it's not. Right. So be a veggie burger is what it should be called. Yes. A real veggie burger instead of fake meat sounds better. Yes. A real veggie burger. I make those. I make black bean burgers. They're very good. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, veggie, veggie burgers are really exciting. <laughs> uh, <so laughs> anyway... Uh, if you want to learn more about it, our, our, our uh, previous shows are now on our website, retirerelax.com, so you can do that. Learn about us. There's videos on there, free videos, all kinds of stuff, reports. Everything's free on our website. We don't capture names, numbers, nothing. So anyway, see you next week. Have a great week. The views expressed on the show should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities or services mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risk, including loss of principal invested. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. No strategy can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information should only be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Securities are offered through Royal Alliance Associates Incorporated, member FINRA and SIPC. Advisory services are offered through Rosenberg Financial Group, a registered investor advisor not affiliated. Affiliated with Royal Alliance Associates Incorporated. Offices are located at 2517 Moody Road, Warner Robins, and 4875 Riverside Drive, Suite 201 in Macon. Phone numbers are 922-8100 and 741-4457.